Welcome to the Delaware OBGYN Resident Lecture Series. I'm your host, Jim Manling. This is a lecture series designed for our residents here at Christiana Hospital in Newark, Delaware, as well as for our sonographers at the Delaware Center for Maternal and Fetal Medicine. Joining us today are OBGYN residents Dr. Semitha McClure and Brenda Patel, both PGY2 residents of the class of 2015. Hi, I'm Brenda Patel. And I'm Samatha McClure. We'll start by discussing the typical clinical situations in which retained products of conception are suspected or at least must be ruled out, followed by a discussion of how ultrasound is used in making the diagnosis. Finally, we'll briefly discuss the management of retained products of conception. So our typical patient who we see in triage who we're concerned about retained products will come in, complain of heavy bleeding after either a loss at home or a DNC in the surgery center or in the office when they've seen their physician. They'll come in, tell us that they had their procedure a day or two ago and they continued bleeding. Every now and then they'll complain of extremely heavy bleeding that soaks through a pad in an hour for two hours in a row. At that point, we'll have them come in for an exam We'll do a speculum exam just to make sure we can't see uh, anything abnormal in the vaginal vault or at the cervix. Afterwards, we'll continue with a pelvic exam uh, to make sure the uterus is clamping down appropriately. Before going to the use of ultrasound in the diagnosis, a review of the placental anatomy can help to understand how tissue can be retained and the ultrasound findings. At the time of implantation, the blastocyst burrows into the decidua, and understanding of the decidua is important. To review, the villi are fetal and the decidua is maternal. The placenta is essentially the interface between the fetal villi and the maternal decidua. The uterus is myometrium lined by endometrium. The endometrium, which is epithelium supported by relatively loose connective tissue called stroma, undergoes significant change in response to the high levels of progesterone associated with pregnancy and becomes decidua. The stromal cells become large and polygonal and resemble epithelium. Maternal vessels within the decidua have been eroded into and now pump blood into newly created spaces in the massive fetal tissue. These newly spaces between the clumps of villi are referred to as the intervillous space. The clump of villi sits in the intervillous space, somewhat separated from the next clump of villi by decidual septae that divide the placenta grossly into lobules. The functional unit of the placenta, the cotyledon, is a clump of fetal villi, tethered to the bottom of the intervillous space by anchoring villi, with a maternal arteriole delivering oxygenated blood to that clump of villi. These 15 to 30 cotyledons correspond roughly to 15 to 30 lobules on the gross specimen of the placenta. Think of the placenta as one big intervillous space. The space is lined by fetal chorionic cells. Maternal blood is pumped in through 15 to 30 maternal arterioles and drained through a bunch of veins. Now, think of the intervillous space containing 15 to 30 cotton balls made of fetal chorionic villi with fetal vessels inside. Each maternal arteriole pumps into a cotton ball. The functional unit is the cotyledon. The interface between the chorionic cells and the decidua cells develop a bunch of pockets of fibrinoid degeneration in a row called knit a box layer. They become pockets of weakness in the adherence of the fetal to maternal tissue, just like perforations between postage stamps. After delivery, there is a rapid decrease in the size of the uterus. The wall of the uterus attached to the placenta is suddenly shorter. This causes folding of the amnion and chorion. Like the perforations between postage stamps that help but don't guarantee cleavage between the stamps, the placenta forms a cleavage plane between fetal and maternal tissue. Hemorrhage forms in those perforations, which serves to propagate that cleavage plane. In first trimester abortions, the nitabach layer is not well developed, and separations tends to not occur as quickly. There is hemorrhage into the tissue, followed by necrosis of the tissues adjacent to that area of bleeding.
This inefficient separation leads to a high incidence of incomplete and missed abortions. Retained products of conception are unusual after an induced first trimester abortions, but can be common with uterine anomalies. For the same reason, preterm second and third trimester deliveries are associated with an increased rate of retained POCs. The placenta is supposed to separate like peeling off a post-it note. The forces holding the paper together are stronger than the weak adhesive holding the note to the surface. The Knitabox layer is a weak adhesive. When you try to pull off a regular sticker off glass like your windshield, the adhesive is so strong, it is often stronger than the paper, so you lose your cleavage plane and the paper tears, leaving half of the sticker on your windshield. The same thing happens with an accreta. There is no decidua, therefore no Knitabox layer and a very adherent placenta, so you lose your cleavage plane, leaving part of the placenta attached. Other times, Knit a box layer is there, but the placenta is weakened in other places from infection. So you lose your cleavage plane, like peeling off a wet sticker. The new abnormal cleavage plane may leave a little chorionic tissue, or it may leave a whole cotyledon with the maternal arterial pumping into it intact. Ultrasound is the first line imaging for retained products. There are no pathognomonic findings for retained POCs. There are several pertinent ultrasound findings, each with their own positive and negative predictive values. The first is a focal endometrial mass. It must be distinct from the rest of the endometrium and be measurable in three dimensions. When these criteria are met, the positive predictive value is 80%. The next is an irregular endo or myometrial interface. This is nonspecific and subjective and is seen frequently in asymptomatic patients, therefore not very helpful. The next is endometrial thickness. This is reproducible, but there is little agreement upon thresholds. Reports vary from 2 to 15 millimeters. One study reported a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 99% using 8 millimeters, whereas another found that 31 of 36 patients with retained decidua, not products of conception, had a thickness greater than 8 millimeters. Still another found 74 first trimester DNCs who did not need surgical follow and 27% had a thickness greater than 20 millimeters. On the other hand, the finding of a thin endometrium has a good negative predictive value. In two studies, the negative predictive value for POCs when the endometrial thickness was less than 8 to 10 millimeters was 100%. Of course, Another study showed that POCs can be found within an endometrial thickness of less than 5. Here is an example of vascularity of the endometrial echo. This is in contrast to the mass lacking vascularity, which turned out to be a clot. Again here is vascularity. And here is a lack of vascularity. In one study, 18% of patients with POCs had no detectable flow, but the positive predictive value was 96%. For this finding, that intact cotyledon of villi and functioning maternal vessels is required. In another study, 75% of masses with flow turned out to be POCs, with the remainder being subinvolution or decidua. It can be difficult to differentiate a vascular myometrium from a vascular endometrial mass. Transvaginal ultrasound showed some fluid within the endometrial cavity, probably blood. The endometrial myometrial interface was not particularly distinct. There was some concern of an intracervical mass at that time. Transvaginal ultrasound of the cervix confirmed the suspicion of an intracervical mass. At that time, there was not thought to be any significant vascularity to the mass within the endometrial cavity, and it was thought that the mass within the cervical canal was either clot or products of conception preparing to be extruded, and for that reason, uh, the clinician opted for expectant management. Two weeks later, the patient returned with persistent bleeding. A repeat ultrasound was performed, which looked very similar to the first ultrasound in that there seemed to be primarily uh, mass within the 
cervix uh, or lower uterine segment. However, with color Doppler, it was clear that there was vascularity to the endometrial mass and that this polypoid mass had its blood supply arising in the fundus of the uterus. Based on these findings and the positive predictive value of vascularity to an endometrial mass, the decision was made uh, to take the patient for curatage because of presumed retained products of conception. The reason for the vascularity having a high predictive value um, for retained products requiring curatage is that it, what it indicates is that the architecture of the placenta has remained intact, that there is maternal vessels feeding the intervillous space, and um, that that fetal tissue may remain viable. The paternal vasculature feeds into the intervillous space, which normally is um, intact, and there is no uh, extravasation or blood outside the intervillous space. Um, but the fact that part of the placenta is, has, is missing uh, means the intervillous space is not intact and that the patient is free to bleed. Over time, this can develop into the entity called a placental polyp, which essentially is a piece of remaining placenta containing fetal villi that are uh, viable and functioning, secreting HCG, um, and retaining the maternal vasculature. A placental polyp can persist for months um, in the endometrial cavity. A polyp remote from a pregnancy um, can be confused with an endometrial polyp, which is endometrial um, stroma covered by uh, the endometrial lining, as opposed to a placental polyp, which contains uh, fetal villi. In this case, uh, the patient presented also at approximately 12 weeks um, with an early pregnancy failure um, uh, of a previously viable pregnancy. Uh, the patient presented with persistent bleeding. At the time of the ultrasound, she was found to have a thickened endometrial mass measuring uh, at least 22 millimeters. Um, and its hypoechoic appearance was suggestive of clot uh, as opposed to uh, placental tissue. Color Doppler um, failed to show any vasculature to this endometrial thickened uh, mass here and for that reason uh, the diagnosis of clot was made. Uh, based on this information the clinician um, gave uterotonics, specifically misoprostol, um, and the patient ended up resolving her bleeding uh, without the need for curatage. In summary, no signs are pathognomonic. Thin endometrium, less than 10 millimeters, has high negative predictive value. Presence of vascularity has high positive predictive value.